morning. Thank you for joining Open Government Week. Uh, this is something where a variety of different folks in different countries around the world are presenting some of their experiences with open government on a number of different topics, ranging, ranging from, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ranging from uh, uh, community development to uh, data transparency uh, to electoral uh, issues. Um, we have put together uh, a number of different perspectives instead of the usual kind of, hey, what did we do to present and share open data? We're kind of taking a user centric perspective to say, all right, for open data and open government portals, what are users actually using in terms of data? What are the most frequently accessed pieces of data? So we've assembled a group of four experts from different countries and different continents to be able to not say for certain who's using the data or what are the use cases, but to offer our expert judgment as to what is most likely to be the use or perhaps what we think might be an interesting use. The reason for that, of course, is when a data set is downloaded from an open government portal, in almost every instance, it's downloaded anonymously. So it's not possible to say who is actually using it or to say directly what are the most frequent use cases. Um, but with that in mind, we thought that this would be something that would be quite interesting to countries that are either considering establishing an open data portal or that are considering changing or improving their data portal by either adding data sets or changing its functionality. Um, our initial hypothesis, which you'll see us talk about and test a little bit as we go along, is that many of the open government portals are intended to help strengthen trust in government and to help strengthen government transparency and accountability. And so it'll be interesting to talk a little bit and see whether or not that might be the case based upon the data sets that are actually most frequently used. Before we start, though, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have Anand Trivedi who's a principal at REI Systems. He's the former director for the Government of India's Evidence, Data, and Digitization Portfolio. So he's an expert on Indian government and their open data. Next is Olu Babayami, who is the founder of and is also a monitoring and evaluation and learning specialist at Clones House Nigeria. He has not worked for the government of Nigeria, but is a data expert and a transparency expert. He's also a former Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellow at the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy, which coincidentally is how I met Olu. Next, we have Auntie Helen, who from Finland is a ministerial advisor in the Public Information Communications and Tele Information Communications and Technology Department of Finland's Ministry of Finance. And he's responsible, amongst other things, for the implementation of national and European Union data measures in the Finnish public sector. So you can see we've intentionally chosen folks who represent countries in a variety of geographies, each from a different continent. And I apologize. I am Jeff Myers. I am a senior director with REI Systems. Um, and REI Systems uh, is a independent contractor and supports the United States government. We helped originate and develop data.gov, usaspending.gov, and performance.gov. Um, so we have some deep familiarity with the variety of transparency websites that are used by the US government. I do want to emphasize, though, that in each case, we are presenting our own opinions, not those of our companies, nor necessarily those of our countries. Um, and again, the reason for that is because it's impossible to tell in almost every instance who really is downloading the data and who really is using it. So uh, these are something where, uh, again, it's just not possible to be certain. Um, let me offer kind of a couple of perspectives by way of introduction, and then we'll start sharing with you, uh, and you'll be able to get the slides afterwards. I'll st we'll start sharing with you the data sets that are most frequently downloaded for each of our respective countries. Um, we recognize that in many cases, as I suggested, the purpose of open data in a lot of folks' mind is to strengthen government accountability. Um, but we thought it would be useful to kind of look back and say, well, has that happened? Is that something that's kind of represented by the data sets? Um, we also thought that, uh, that based on the data sets, we could hypothesize about who those users would be in use cases, and that after presenting them, uh, we can kind of think about a little bit about conclusions, both across countries and even within countries. We will want to reserve, though, approximately a half an hour for question and answer, and any participant, any audience member is welcome to ask questions. We will unmute you, and as well, we may ask questions, our panelists may ask questions of each other. Uh, the hope is that perhaps this discussion will uh, promote 
open government and additional data sets from additional countries and from even the countries we represent ourselves. So with that, let me start sharing my screen and I'll present and share with you the open data sets that are the most frequently used in the US government. Um, let me start just uh, for a moment with the agenda. Uh, again, I think I've described this already and see if I can put this in presentation mode. So what I wanted to suggest, again, these may seem to be in random order, and in fact, they relatively are. Right now, they're in the order of the ones that have been most frequently viewed um, as of May 20th of 2024. And so you can see the electric vehicle population data has 3,175 views uh, during the period that data.gov identified. Interestingly, it's just for the state of Washington, one of the 50 states within the US, and it's the electron electric vehicle population data. Now, in this case, uh, of course, Washington state is in vehicle manufacturers may be interested in data like this to say, where's the big audience? Where's the big market? So businesses can do kind of market planning and think about how they can grow. People might think to themselves as individuals, hey, you know, there's kind of a critical mass of electric vehicles and perhaps charging stations. Maybe I ought to jump on board and buy one. And clearly the government might say, you know what? Uh, electric vehicles are becoming a growing a, a part of our uh, uh, transportation solution. We want to regulate, we want to promote, we want to take other actions. So it's clear that they could be used not just for kind of accountability of the government, but for a variety of purposes, heavily commercial and individual. And I think that's kind of a theme that trickles across the various data sets that I looked at for the US government. The second data set is crime data. It happens just to be for the city of Los Angeles, although the uh, uh, data.gov portal does allow access to a variety of other data sets, some of them federal data sets, of course, but some of them also state or local data sets. In this case, again, we thought about, well, there are some business uses. A real estate professional might say, uh, as you're asking about buying a home in a particular neighborhood, do you th are you aware of the high or low crime rates in that neighborhood and to help allay fears of a prospective purchaser? Clearly also though, this is an instance where accountability is a, is, is a big uh, option and perhaps priority so that the public can be aware of what crime data is, crime, what types of crimes are being committed, where and what the trends are. Um, and as well, in this case, it's a situation where we think there's a, a possibility and in fact, a strong likelihood, not just in this case, but in many, an individual human, uh, citizen is maybe not likely to access data sets that are large and complex on data.gov, but they may be served by a proxy, such as a member of the media, who then uses these open data sets to be able to say, there's a big crime problem because crime rates are increasing, or the city of Los Angeles has a much different crime rate than the cities of Chicago or New York or Dallas. And so the media kind of may act in proxy for the individual citizen, but may do so both to help inform citizen choices, as well as to help the government think about, well, how can the government improve? Where and how should the government target police efforts? Is the government being held accountable for prioritizing crime in a sufficient and appropriate way? Um, I'll talk briefly about one or two more, and then I'm, I will invite you all as uh, you scan through them to say, hey, you have some questions about some of them. Um, the FDIC failed bank list is one that is a federal data set, and it identifies which banks have failed uh, due to poor capitalization or poor operating results or poor risk decision making or what have you. And in this case, uh, of course, academic research is interested, kind of uh, financial management business school programs in understanding why banks fail and what can be done about that, what can be learned from that. Clearly, the government is interested in terms of saying, hey, is it something where there is some regulation that is necessary and appropriate for the stability of the financial system? And how might that work or how has that worked with respect to bank failure rates and the types of bank that fails, types of banks that fail? Um, clearly as well, a person who is an investor and buys stock and is interested in buying stock in financial institutions might be interested in those same sorts of trends, which banks are failing, which banks are presenting larger risks, what types of risks might be associated with those bank failures, and so an investor might be making decisions as well. Um, once again, I think kind of the overall lesson I'm seeing is that it's not necessarily the case that the primary user or at all that the exclusive user of these data sets is for kind of holding government accountable or deciding if you trust government. In fact, it seems as if in a large number of these instances, business users who are trying to make business strategy and business operational decisions are very prominent users. And as well, the users that are from the government may be thinking about how to improve their operations, uh, not necessarily just how to be uh, more accountable. 
Um, the last one I'm going to touch on is the number four, which is a dynamic small business surge. And essentially, this is something where the U.S. small, uh, the United States government, the federal government, has determined that much of the growth in jobs in the country comes from small businesses. And so, government wants to use its power and purchasing capability to purchase from small businesses in many instances. And it asks that those small businesses register. And then it creates this tool, which is it allows anyone publicly to search those small businesses. And so what's been happening to a certain extent is that the government, of course, is using this to identify a small business contractor when there's a bid or a purchase decision the government is going to make. But the government explicitly recognizes that small businesses can also use it to identify other small businesses to create teams so they can help fill each other's gap to perform joint ventures and be kind of have more critical mass to be able to capture larger opportunities that they might not be able to capture individually. So I'm going to stop there. Um, once again, at approximately halfway through the session at 8.30, we'll turn it over for questions and answers. But what I'll do is I'll just briefly share with you uh, the last five data sets, which are uh, uh, supply chain greenhouse gas emissions factors, walkability in set index, uh, Powerball winning numbers from lotteries uh, for the New York State Lottery, fruit and vegetable prices, and death rates from suicide. Once again, these are hypotheses that I've developed as to, well, who might be using this data and what purposes they might they be using it for. Once again, you'll see that there is a broad mix of both government users, business users, personal or individual users, and occasionally activist users. So, for example, the suspicion is that with greenhouse gases, activists might say, hey, you know what, if we look at the commodities that are being produced, how much greenhouse gas emission is being created along with those commodity productions, the activists might be using that to say, hey, let's target production of these particular commodities or these particular companies that are producing those commodities and try and encourage them to be more aware or to take stronger action to limit to greenhouse gas emissions. So in this case, perhaps uh, it's not so much government or business or even academia, but it is perhaps activists, and they're not necessarily trying to hold government accountable. Maybe they are through regulation, but they're trying to hold individual businesses or groups of businesses and industries accountable. So let me stop there, and I will invite uh, Olu to uh, take over and talk about the top open government data sets in Nigeria. Olu, do you want to take the baton? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, there I'd, we run, go. I'd run with the button without the sound. <laughs> so, um, I mean, uh, I'd say at the, at the first count, similarly to, um, to your hypothesis with, with the U.S., uh, uh, Niger with Nigeria, economic indicators uh, comes as, as as one of the first data, uh, the most used data sets um, from my own perspective in Nigeria. Um, and I think especially because uh, these data sets, I would say is one of the data sets that have been released continuously, timely, um, every quarter, it, it gets out and, and you see investors trying to make use of some of the data uh, which comes out of uh, uh, the Nigerian Statistics Office. And there are other users as well, aside from uh, those, those in the financial sector. I mean, you have researchers, uh, lawmakers. Interestingly, uh, it's, it's one of the, the data sets that the media uses the most um, um, all the time. So, um, I, I, I take that as, as, as the number one data sets that, that has been used in Nigeria. Um, conversely, um, I think that when you then go down, you then start finding uh, one particular purpose, which is for transparency and accountability. So then comes the second one on the list, the company register. Um, I think the past seven years have been conversations around the open government partnership. In fact, this has been one of the, uh, the data sets that have been in the plan one, plan two, I think plan three of the open government partnership in Nigeria. But now, right now, I mean, in the last one year or so, it is it's now in public domain. And we now have uh, many organizations who, who, who look at that. Uh, you see the tax, people from the tax agency, economic crime agencies, they want to know who owns what in the country. And, and it has become uh, one of the top most data sets. Following that is the budget data of the country. 
uh, I'd say not necessarily for investors to make decisions. I think civil society organizations, activists, um, are, are the ones that are looking more into the financial or budgetary data of Nigeria, especially to make cases for people to understand the government spending, to understand what government is going to spend about on. And I think few, few companies use that to make decisions. Uh, go to the fourth one. Um, so the, the, the four data sets are election results. Uh, and this, I will say, uh, you see a spike in, you will see a spike in, in, in this uh, because uh, it is at certain times, especially the presidential in Nigeria, you have the elections, the presidential and the gov governorship elections at the same time. So at that point, you see a spike in people trying to understand yeah, who wins what, in what location. So political parties are interested in this. You have researchers, you have lawmakers, and also civil society organizations, activists who want to um, actually ensure accountability around election results and, and it's been popular. Similarly also, the procurement data uh, for the country uh, the, uh, if I remember clearly, I mean, organizations like the Open Contracting Partnership, uh, they have tried for the past seven years to make the government have a procurement platform. Um, it's called the Nigerian Open Contracting Portal, but yeah, I mean, majorly, I will say, it's, it's uh, the main purpose is for accountability. In fact, if you go to the portal now, you will see that it's easier for even civil society organizations to to get information other than the private sectors who are supposed to bid and, and consult uh, to bid for, um, for uh, tenders in, on, on, the, on the platform. So that seems interesting to me, uh, which then still means, yes, things around transparency and accountability is the focus. Uh, the sixth one is um, data related to, to health and demographic data. And I think, um uh, this type of data set, uh, it's not routine, so we should not think it's the routine data set. I think it's, it's so it's still the survey kind of data, which comes out at times annually. So it's not as if uh, people are people move towards that or download that a lot, but I think once in a while when researchers want to quote information or use information about um, else of statistics in the country, then they tend to shift toward this. And you have international development partners who also use a little bit of businesses uh, uses this uh, as well. So, so uh, go to the seventh um, uh, data set, uh, which is Nigerian legislations and laws. Of course, this is also for transparency and accountability. Uh, lawyers want to be able to know when some announcements are being made so they can use it. Um, lawmakers also are interested in some of this, the act of the parliament and all this legislation, tracking of bills in the parliament is basically for transparency and accountability. And you also have civil society organizations uh, looking at this data. Uh, then you have population census. Of, unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's been a long year since Nigeria had the census. But I mean, 15 years ago, but since then, there have been several estimates of, of this. And what that has does is making researchers always go into that platform to look at, okay, what are the estimates? What was there back then? How can we use that to estimate what the population of the country is? So uh, basically a few people, researchers go back to it, lawmakers go back to that. Um, maybe not necessarily for accountability anyways. Um, then you have, a, you have the crime data sets, which also is occasionally published uh, by the Nigerian Statistics Office. And you then see like private investigators uh, being interested in that. Little bit of businesses uh, tend towards that data sets. Um, and, and, and the last, but not the least uh, kind of data set is the education statistics of, of the country, uh, which you see few data sets. So you will see, find also researchers 
trying to uh, look for data sets uh, for, yeah, maybe states, um, if they can find any. Um, but I, I think, I mean, largely, uh, some of these data sets are available, but I, I'd like to, to point out that I think it's a mixed bag um, in Nigeria. I mean, you cannot necessarily place it uh, with transparency and accountability or, or those that are used for making business decisions. However, uh, I think that the movement for open government data set is hinged on transparency and accountability. And that's why you will see like five of these data sets that are here uh, actually tends towards uh, transparency and accountability. And one other thing came up, when you talk about education and even health, some people that are interested in it are like activists who also wants to use that to hold some government accountable. So I, I think I'd pause uh, that point and, and, and take it back to, to Jeff. Okay, great. Thank you, Olu. Um, let's turn next to India and ask Anand Trivedi. Anand, can you talk to us a little bit about the data sets available from India's open government portals? Sure, thank you. Uh, and uh, nice to have this audience today. Um, so before I get into the specifics of the data sets in India, just a little bit of context. So India became a part of the signatory, uh, India became a signatory to the open government partnership somewhere in 2011. And then uh, I think in terms of publishing data sets, there was, there was already initial momentum starting from that point in time. But a lot of work has primarily happened in the last 10 years when it comes to A, uh, adhering to the principles of open uh, government data sets, and also secondly, in terms of driving the usage of all of these data sets. So it's not just that there is a data.gov.in equivalent in India, which publishes all these public data sets, but also there is now a comprehensive layer of national data analytics platform, which has been built on top of that, which drives the usage of all of these data and enables it and makes it so much more easier for a lot of users to analyze these data and draw insights out of it. So just a little bit of context, and now I will jump right into the data sets. So this uh, is based on the most viewed catalog available on the data.gov.in as on May 29. And uh, it captures the most used behavior for the last 12 months. And it is quite reflective in a lot of senses of the economic situations and the changes that are happening in India in that context. So for example, the very first uh, thing, which is quite interesting, uh, is the All India PIN code or equivalent of US zip code directory which has the most number of views and by far it is much higher than the second and the third uh, used data sets. And there, the key drivers, the users, uh, as, as I presume, is of course the citizens, business and governments. But I think one of the key drivers for this pin code directory being used is the growth of e-commerce that the country has seen in the last few years. Uh, also logistics companies, government department, market research agencies for finalizing their micro segment, geographical segments, and also a lot of emergency services providers are the ones who are leveraging uh, these data sets. So that is the first. The second, again, which you can see is the company master data. So as you can see, a lot of this information is around registers. So when you look at public data sets, there are two types of data sets. One is primarily data registers, which basically are repositories of entities. And the other set of data sets are around performance or the state of the situation or the economy. So the PIN code directory is a register. Company master data is again a register. That's used heavily because it com comprises of the master details of all the companies registered in, the, in India. And that's leveraged sig significantly for regulatory compliance, due diligence, and also presumably because the investors and the businesses are leveraging it for conducting business research, planning for the financial decision making and also credit agencies, which also speaks to the increasing uh, corporatization of, and, and the growth, economic growth that the country is seeing at this point. Third is the total and the newly registered motor vehicles. Now it's interesting that this data set uh, we saw also saw was all used uh, significantly in the US as well. And it's used for multiple uh, entities, be it governments or businesses. But primarily, the users come on the business side from the insurance agencies, transport planning segments, and so on and so forth. And from the uh, 
business side, it uh, or from the government side, it can come in from the traffic management and transport policy making as well, apart from its potential uses in research and academia. Uh, then the fourth is the state and the district wise list of vulnerable groups. So scheduled caste and scheduled tribe populations is the data set which represents vulnerable groups in the country and which need social supports and they are used extensively in policy and program planning because every government scheme has certain or most of the government schemes have certain specific targets for each of these uh, sets of vulnerable groups. And secondly, uh, there is social and economic uh, research, political analysis and academic research, which is presumably using these data sets. Uh, then there is database of the Indian economy by the Reserve Bank of India, which is the central bank. And that is used significantly for monetary policy, fiscal policy planning, but also used largely a lot by the media agencies for analyzing the data and putting up conversations on economic performance, apart from uh, a lot of investor community as well. Next slide, please. So these are the top five uh, data sets. And as you can see, the rest of the five, I'll quickly move through the rest of the five, uh, are around the production statistics for crops talking about the progress of agriculture, which is largely used for both policy making by the government as well as academia and uh, businesses, uh, growing agribusiness businesses in the country. Uh, then also the consumer price index, uh, which is primarily reflective of inflation, which is leveraged significantly for all the economic research and also a lot of labor policy and wage determinations across the country. Uh, the, India has created its own uh, geo platform uh, which leverages its own satellite network for geographical information. And that is leveraged significantly by the governments for uh, and also some of the businesses for specific uh, geospatial planning and related information and also applications around that. Uh, you'll see that across all these data sets, the heavy growth of apps and heavy growth of e-commerce in the country is one of the key drivers across a lot of these data sets apart from the uh, some of the aspects of Indian Railways, which is the large, one of the largest networks of railways in the world, which is leveraged extensively by citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is, again, one of the data sets which is leveraged, uh, used by the citizens. And lastly, it is about the import-export classifications, again, talking about its uses for businesses. So bro these are the broad sets of data sets. In a lot of ways, as we have seen for the other countries as well, it is a reflection of the state of digitization in the country at large, both on the public as well as the private sector, and also reflective of the nature of the economy and the stage of maturity of that, that particular country and its economy is. So uh, I will hand it over to uh, Antti for us to uh, take a look at the Finland scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Antti, do you want to share with us your perspective on Finnish data sets? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Anand. <clears throat> um, so just as a disclaimer before I get started quickly, um, these are from our opendata.fi portal uh, based on the statistics from that. Not every single open data set, of course, in Finland is available through this portal necessary. So that's also partly going to explain some of the results here. Uh, for instance, like election results or healthcare data, that's something that's available through other portals. So that's going to like kind of uh, change the outcome somewhat, but that's that's fine because I think this is going to be very interesting because we're going to start with uh, top most popular data set on open data .fi, and that's Finnish names. <clears throat> All the first names and surnames that have been registered in the population information system of Finland. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, uh, I think I can think of a couple of reasons why this is. One is that in Finland there's a rule that um, you that there's like very strict rules on what name what name you can give to a newborn child and one of the rules is that if it's an established name that enough people in the population information system already have then that name is that something that's okay to give to your child but if it's like a completely new unique name then it has to be submitted to this uh, board that then determines whether you're allowed to give your child that name or not so i think one reason this th this data set is so popular is that people are going in and checking out which names are okay which are established names that can be given to newborn babies another could be 
just like finding inspiration for names uh, and also um, researchers might be interested in this data and also the, it's a pretty perennial um, news story in the press is like well these are the top 10 names that were given to uh, Finnish speaking uh, to, the, to the children in Finnish speaking families and in Swedish speaking families so that's probably another reason why this data set is so popular. Uh, the next two data sets on the slide are both about building addresses uh, and uh, coordinates and so on. And I think this is just mainly like a very practical reason, like finding uh, finding where a given uh, building is or w what buildings a given address has. There could be regulatory reasons for this. The public sector might be interested in this kind of information um, to maybe get more creative. I was thinking maybe businesses could be interested in this data just to like build a list of addresses to send marketing materials to. Uh, I also think some citizens uh, might be interested in like snooping on each other, like um, people in Finland love having these summer cottages out in the countryside on the lakes, on the rivers, and then they might be look, keeping an eye out like, well, has my neighbor built, like my neighbor has erected a new building on their lot and I don't like it. Are they actually allowed to have that? Is it an illegal building? Should I report that to the authorities? Uh, then the fourth top, uh, top four uh, data set is about the war victims in the Second World War from 1939 to 1945, specifically uh, military casualties. And I think this is mainly historical and uh, genealogical research. A lot of Finns have um, uh, grandparents or great grandparents who fought in the war uh, or uh, who fought and died in the wars. So they might be interested in just doing research on their roots that way. Uh, then uh, data set number five, and we can go to the next slide because the next data set is going to be very similar to data set number five. These are about how, what are the application criteria and admission criteria for upper secondary schools in Helsinki. Uh, and this, I believe, is because most of, the, most of the elite upper secondary schools in Finland, the schools that you go to when you're like 15, 16 years old after comprehensive school, I think uh, most of the so-called elite schools in Finland are in Helsinki. So this is about parents and potential candidates for upper secondary school who want to do research on which schools are the ones that they might be eligible for and like what kind of grades should they be getting in school so that they can so that they can get into a school that specializes in uh, in music or sports and so on. Uh, number seven, uh, we have the registry of businesses allowed to sell or serve alcohol. I think this is mostly used by regulatory bodies to uh, kind of check on whether a given business is allowed to sell or serve alcohol. And I also think uh, in the restaurant business, this might be an easy way to figure out whether there's a lot of potential competition in an area. Like if you want to start a bar in a certain location, then you want to find out if there are already a lot of bars there pre-existing. Uh, number eight, we have road traffic accidents. Uh, I think this is used mostly by researchers and regulatory bodies because it's like a good way to figure out where the dangerous roads or the dangerous spots and intersections on roads are so that you can uh, identify, well, that's something that we should probably do something about. Maybe we need traffic lights in that intersection. Maybe we need to lower the speed limit and so on. Uh, at number nine, uh, we have data from openprocurement.fi. So this is also available, available at a separate portal, openprocurement.fi. And this is about procurement data for the Finnish central government. So this obviously is about uh, activists, journalists, citizens, researchers wanting to find out where taxpayer money goes. So what are the companies that were... Um, like what companies did the government buy the most services from in a given year or if like a city, if like a small municipality spent a lot of money on legal bills one year then that means that there's probably something that a journalist might want to dig into further and at number 10 this is basically the same as the second world war data set it's about people wanting to investigate their uh, family history or just doing uh, historical research in general thanks great um, so let's uh, stop and, and see whether or not there are questions that uh, folks have who are part of the audience. Um, you're welcome to raise your hand. You are certainly welcome to uh, 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 unmute yourself. It may be that we have to unmute you as well. Um, any, and I'm struggling to get back to the home screen. Uh, does anyone have questions from the audience? Otherwise, I actually have one or two. 
Okay, so let me, I'll ask one or two questions. And again, I invite members from our panel to ask questions also. Um, one of the questions I had starting with you, Olu, is there seem to be lots of different websites where a person might have to go for data from Nigeria's kind of uh, government uh, uh, transparency efforts. Interestingly, one of them seems to be Africa wide, but my question is, let's pretend there were a user, let's pretend it were a, a media reporter who said, you know, several of these topics are interesting. How would they find the data if there's not a kind of a central portal that kind of points them to which direction they should look? Do they have to be a genius like you and just know where it all sits and have done years of research to find it? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I mean, I, I think like four years ago, uh, I did a, a, what the folks from Transparency and Accountability and Global Integrity in the US, we did a research focusing on data use uh, and specifically procurement data in, in Nigeria. And it was like a three years uh, kind of uh, research work trying to answer this question. <laughs> and I mean, one of one of the thing we got, things we got out is that users need to have that capacity currently in Nigeria. Like, like it's not fluid for you to, to get a, a data of the part of, of, of the government. And you can actually see that most of the data presented here is actually by the government. So I think that also tells another story that even even tech those in the tech world cannot even plug in into the current data set uh, that you have perhaps maybe apis are broken perhaps maybe there are inconsistencies in that data set so uh, but anyways it, it's two ways but just to answer your question uh, i think it's still difficult you need to have that expertise you need to be willing even activists that use some of the data sets do not have the capacity to to do that and it's a push and pull thing it might be that the platforms are not easy to use you know and maybe when they're easy to use the activists hasn't, hasn't built that capacity you know i'll start there Jeff, i have one more question here. for you olu and then i invite uh, any of our panelists to ask each other questions as well as members of the audience so when I first started work in open government transparency around 2010, almost 15 years ago, I thought, well, this is great because it will allow the public to see if a corrupt government official is causing the government to spend money in a way that is going to, you know, the government official's friend or or parent uh, to a company, for example, that is, uh, you know, controlled in one way or another by that government official. And and what I found is interesting is uh, in the United States, for example, the financial transparency websites, they will tell who receives the uh, payments from government, but they don't tell who authorizes the payment from within government, whether it's a contracting officer or an elected official or whether it's <clears throat> just a, a career civil servant. Um, so it, it strikes me that in, in some countries it's very hard to achieve what I think some people, maybe others aside from me, thought, hey, that's one of the purposes of open government transparency, which is to try and reduce government corruption. So my question, and maybe first for you, Olu, and then and, uh, Auntie and, and Anand, please jump in if you'd like. Is there a way that you perceive from the data that you see is available in Nigeria for someone who is suspicious? Let's say, again, a reporter who says, I want to track down whether or not a government official is enriching themselves at the public expense. So my question to you, Olu, is, is that easy to do? Is that possible? Is that difficult or not possible from your experience? Yeah, I think if, if we if we leave it at the open the, the data sets that are being provided by the government, I think is a difficult task uh, to do. Um, but I think, I mean, what people now resort to is do their own investigative journalism and, and get their own data because that pipeline might then be owned by the individual who wants to go into that journalism and, mm -hmm. and do all the value chains of getting the data, sourcing it, uh, visualizing and publishing it. But in the case of the government, um, and I'm not sure it's, it's, a, it's a difficult task for, for anyone to use that to track uh, who is doing what or who gets out. However, I think there's, there's been an improvement. I mean, it's been eight years of 
open government partnership in Nigeria. If I look back like eight years ago, for example, the procurement platform, uh, I think there was no data uh, even up till two years ago. But now, yeah, I mean, there's a trickle of some level of data sets, but you need to do so many, you need to join so many data sets together. Jeff. So you've, you've seen improvement. And just to be clear, so everybody's aware, Olu is not a Nigerian government employee, nor a Nigerian government contractor. So you've seen improvement, but you still say kind of it takes a lot of work and some creative uh, creative and, and uh, in-depth reporting. Great. Um, I see that uh, Ushnish Sengupta, I hope I'm spell, uh, pronouncing your name correctly, uh, has a question. Please, I think you can now uh, unmute yourself, Ushnish, um, by cl clicking the little microphone option. And it, you can also show yourself on camera if you'd like and ask your question. Ushnish, I'm not hearing you. Have you managed to uh, unmute yourself? I don't know, Ashley, so, are, are you? Sorry? So Ushnish uh, has already uh, asked a question, and that's in the Q&A window ah. of the, and that's a question uh, for you, Jeff. The question okay. says that the popular data sets reported from the US are per state or per city. Do you see similar ah. trends across states and cities? Yeah. Um, so I think with data.gov in the United States, it's probably not unusual. It is a portal which is designed to make it easy to find the data that governments share. There is a, a federal level requirement that the default assumption is that you will share data unless there is a strong reason not to. And the few reasons not to are prescribed, you know, national security data, personally identifiable information, things like that. Um, that is not necessarily consistently the case across all states in the United States, nor across all municipalities. So where you see, for example, the crime data from the city of Los Angeles, I believe you would probably relatively easily find crime data for New York City or for Chicago, and you would find national data sets that would be provided and managed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation around crimes. But if you ask me, well, you've got data for Los Angeles, what about Orange County or San Diego? Um, I, at this stage, can't make any guarantee that it's possible to see data from those sources. It's, again, up to the government agency to be able to say, yes, we'll release it or no, we won't. And then it does, frankly, you know, our experience has been governments are very nervous about someone might subsequently say, hey, that data has got mistakes in it. What are you doing, government agency? So the government generally puts a lot of energy into making sure the data is accurate, is consistent, is a complete data set, and at least to thinking about kind of how it might be used so that they'll be prepared to answer questions or criticisms about it. So the answer is I don't see that. I, I see a number of states and cities have open government tendencies and trends, not all. Some of them make it a budgetary priority, um, but it's not uh, not uniformly the case. And now I see that, Auntie, you have a question for someone. Um, I don't have a question, but I noticed that there's an interesting, like I noticed the other question in the Q&A from the audience. So I thought I'd answer that. And I also have, something to answer about the question about procurement data and corruption. But I'll talk about the algorithm registers yet. I also, I noticed this because uh, I actually like Helsinki is the capital. I live in Helsinki and yes, indeed, Helsinki has an algorithm register, um, which I think is available as open data. Uh, however, we don't really have, um, we don't have like uh, an established system where uh, in-use algorithms would be published as open data. I think this is partly maybe because a lot of the algorithms in use uh, are probably to like um, the algorithm itself or the idea that you're or the algorithm that you're using for a given purpose. It might be a little too complicated for most people to even understand what the algorithm is about. Or you could have that if you draw the definition to uh, uh, broad, you could have thousands of algorithms that you then need to have in the register. We do have legislation in place that if a government authority is using algorithms to make automatic decisions, then they have to publish the, the essential details of that process on their website. But there isn't a, a concentrated register of these public sector algorithms. Uh, I do know that the European Union uh, is uh, going to establish a so-called artificial intelligence system database, which is going to contain uh, in-use high-risk AI systems. This is going to be somewhere in the next 12 months, I think, and that's going to be public and available to all, so that's going to be 
open as well. On the on the procurement question, if I may, um, I think for us at least, uh, at least in the Finnish context, like the procurement data is like it's just a way for the journalist to find out who to ask which questions next. We had a case uh, in a city here recently where someone uh, where the where a small city had spent 400,000 euros on outdoor gym equipment, which raised the questions, well, why is this city spending so much money on this kind of equipment? And then the journalist was able to use the use transparency laws to find out the official who had done the procurement decision and to interview them. And they were able to unravel the case that way. And that official had to be set aside because they had spent too much money on gym equipment and there was probably some handouts being involved. But yeah. Okay. Um, I think ah, Graham Campbell has a question. Uh, and actually, I'm not sure whether people actually can unmute themselves. Um, Mr. Campbell, if you can unmute yourself, please do and ask the question. If you cannot, would you type your question into the chat or into the Q&A? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear oh, you. I think somebody unmuted me, <laughs> so that's even better. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so a lot of the, the data sets that you've talked about sound like things that, some of them sound like things that might be, you know, presented as downloadable as a complete, um, as a complete set in like some kind of Excel file or a CSV file or something like that. And some of them sound like that might be unwieldy to actually download in that format. And I'm just wondering if there, if the the availability or the way that the users are, the ways available for users to interact with the different data sets you're talking about has a noticeable impact on how popular it is. Like if it's, if you're, I'm trying to think of a good example of one where like if if um, you know the for example like the war victims in second world war for genealogical research i can imagine like if it is being used by members of the public for genealogical research maybe if it's available as some kind of search interface or like people looking for procurement information for to do government accountability from the outside if there's a database they can search it might be uh, more heavily used from the public than if they have to download like a complete data set and then do an analysis themselves. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, did you notice when you were put, looking at this list of top data sets, like, is the way that the data availability is, are, are there any aspects of that that you think factor into which are the most popular? Take a quick crack at that and then invite other panelists to jump in. I, what I'll tell you, and this is again from the far and away most frequently used open data set uh, at the, the kind of the retail, the individual level in the United States doesn't even appear on the list. And that is weather data. And so people understand that they're not going to go look online at data.gov for weather data. What they're going to do is they're going to pull up an app on their iPhone and they're going to check and see what's the weather near me. And so what that means is there is an automated connection between the National Weather Service, which gathers the data, data.gov, which is the portal that essentially it's just kind of like a library index that sits on top of data that's provided by dozens of different individual agencies. Data.gov does not suck up and maintain and, uh, the, the, and keep records or a copy of the data. It simply keeps an example so people can see and know what they're looking for. But it does include pointers so that you can, for example, if you're a, an app builder on a smartphone, um, you can create an automatic connection that will download data at whatever level of detail it's available and you choose, and it will download it as often as you choose. You know, it may be, I don't know what it is, every hour, every half hour or something like that for the weather data. So the fact is that, the, you know, the number of frequencies uh, with which weather data is requested from data.gov is not that high, but in part it's because all these automated connections have been built. And those, I think, kind of general rules uh, apply across data.gov in the U.S., which is, what's requested by separate individual requesters may not necessarily represent the frequency of use of the data and how easy it is to get and use depends on you know 
their perceptions of the uses value and the investments made by in the US the private sector to build those apps and then to you know offer or sell the use of those apps to the private sector. You know, I go on the weather app on my iPhone and I don't pay anything for it other than having bought the iPhone originally, um, although there is some advertising and some other sorts of capabilities that kind of uh, uh, make it, I assume, I assume, remunerative to the people who built the app. Anybody else want to uh, jump on that question? Yeah, I I can add a few more things. So, uh, and so, so, Graham, actually the standards for data sharing are uniform and all the signatories to the open government data partnership have to adhere to the same. So they have to have the data sets available in three or four different formats, which includes Excels and CSV files, as you mentioned, but also in what Jeff was referring to as the data sets, which can be accessed through APIs. Now, data.gov or data.gov.in or equivalent websites across the world are just a cataloging website. The original owners of those data sets might be those respective agencies or departments of the government in the or uh, in that particular country. Now, when it comes to and which is why you will see that a lot of these registered type of data sets like company masters in case of India or pin codes or zip codes and so on and so forth are the ones which are up appearing at the top because they are being frequently accessed through APIs. Now, these APIs are automatically pulling the, that data up and integrating it into various consumer side apps which may be using it. So that's one. At the same time, in the Indian government, when this particular need was identified, that while these registered sort of data sets are frequently being used, there is a lot of performance data which is not being leveraged as much. For example, let's say there is a scheme for uh, national sanitation, right? Uh, and expansion campaign. Now, those data sets are available, census data sets are available, but they are not easily uh, usable and you cannot join two or three different data sets together to draw insights, especially from a research or a academic uh, perspective. So that need was felt and which is why the government uh, took a step up and created this national data analytics platform which sits on top of all of these publicly available data sets so there's this central repository of all the public data sets and very easily you can just plug and play data sets and create your own visualizations or insights to start working on your research by adding multiple data sets. There you can add filters by geography. So that refers to one of the questions that earlier was asked. You can filter out some of the data sets. You can define geographical boundaries. You can do all sorts of cross-sectional analysis on top of that. So it's a seamless platform which has now been created. Looks like uh, Stephen Buckley or Stephen Buckley has a question. Stephen, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. Please in, ask your question. And, and if there's a particular okay. person you'd like to ask it up, please say. OK, uh, this could go to anybody. Uh, as I hope you know, uh, open government is all about um, informing and engaging the public in decisions that affect their lives. and it would be really nice. And I'd, I'm wondering, like, Mike, so my question is, hmm, what would need to happen in order for there to be, uh, let's say, a map? What kind of data? How would it be generated? Who would generate it? If there was a map, say, of a country that showed uh, different parts of the country having uh, a different quality of public engagement. So uh, I, I see one of the data sets that you mentioned was walkability in um, the United States. So you can, yeah. you can now you can pull up this map and you can look and see at your uh, your uh, state or your um, your city and see where it's safe to walk and not so safe and so forth. And if there was something like that, that's what I would like to be able to see to say, oh look, if you go to a public meeting in uh, New York. It's this part of New York is better for public meetings. They they do a better job of engaging the public than say in another part of the country or another part of the state or, or another part of the county or something like that. So since this crosses over many agencies, yeah. I'm wondering it's like, hmm, who would I approach if that data set if that data doesn't exist yet? How does it get born? How does it? 
how would it go from where it is now to a map? Yeah. So that's my question. Let me offer a, a very quick reaction. I'm not aware that such a thing exists. It sounds like it would be really interesting. And in fact, it sounds like the open government partnership kind of across countries might be a good organization to say, hey, can you identify, you know, how should we measure engagement? And then perhaps set a standard to say across countries, perhaps could we each in all countries who are willing, you know, begin gathering and reporting this data so that then we can kind of create a map such as you share that, uh, you know, helps evaluate to some extent, you know, is is uh, your country doing a good job providing open data by increasing engagement of the citizenry? Let me um, ask whether or not our panelists in the last couple of minutes would like to offer any kind of conclusions, and we thought we would just go in kind of reverse order. So, Auntie, would you like to start with the conclusions that you might have drawn from hearing the various presentations? Uh, thank you. I think what, like the main takeaway comparing Finnish data sets and like how our open data portal figures in, in comparison to maybe the other open data portals like data.gov is that uh, our model seems to be a lot more decentralized. So there are like these certain key data sets that I think are critical for any society or any country like health data or election result data and so on. Uh, it seems that in some countries those are very centralized into a given portal Portal, and then at least in our case they are not necessarily in the in the actual open data portal per se but they are still available through some other means maybe it's just that if a data set is considered of such great importance then like maybe the like, like I don't know what the line of thinking for us has been maybe it isn't an intentional process but it's that well election data is so important that it needs to be on the election data website it doesn't have to be on the portal because people are going to go to the election data website to look at it it doesn't have to be findable on the portal and so on. Mm -hmm. so that's maybe like my takeaway from this is that the way our portals are constructed and the way we are like collecting data sets into them like I, I'm detecting that there's maybe a small difference or maybe even a major difference in philosophies there. Yeah. Anand, would you like to go next? Yeah, and I think one of the key takeaways from the conversation today for me was that while open government and publishing data sets uh, in the open domain is an important first step towards moving the governments towards greater transparency and accountability. It is equally important that on the demand side for us to create that pull from the users, we have to make those additional steps to drive, have them use more of these data more and more. And for that, there are various ways which we can experiment with. The, the potential use case being the, uh, the national data analytics platform, which has been created in the Indian case. Oh. Can you unmute yourself and offer your thoughts? I, I think, I think, I mean, looking Ooh, across. There we go. Looking across uh, the the data sets that have been shared here, I, 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 I'm I'm starting to think that it could actually be a measure of the capacity of each government of the state itself in in pushing out data sets for people to then layer on. Uh, because if I look at the case of Nigeria, I mean, we still have basic data sets we're still struggling with so that other, uh, just like Anna said, so that other um, users can plug in on it and make use of it in different ways. So, so I see, I see that uh, capacities across governments differs and, and that is the reflection of how those data are being used, whether it's for transparency and accountability, or whether it's for businesses or small businesses, or whether it's for doing good uh, for other reasons. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. And I myself have a couple of comments, one of which is that um, I was thinking originally, again, that this was primarily open government was kind of about reducing corruption, improving trust in government. Turns out in my mind, based on this exercise, that actually a lot of it's about kind of assisting commercial development and helping businesses make strategy decisions, helping governments do a little bit better job at management. Um, and I think, again, this has been interesting because very few places can really certainly say, here's what open data is used for. And therefore, very few countries, in my experience, ask, what do you want? Uh, of potential users of open data. They mostly just say, here's what we got. You want it? Um, and it might be very interesting to kind of engage, for example, a chamber of commerce or a group of businesses to say, what data would you like 
especially, you know, I was impressed with the government of India information and on shared to say, hey, you know, the the kind of the, the address and type of business information and type of residence information is very important for e-commerce. Uh, you know, it's clear India is kind of thinking strategically about how can we promote e-commerce? That's an important part of our economy. And my thought was, well, other countries could probably kind of plot out what open data might help grow their business opportunities, their employment opportunities, their public safety or what have you. Um, we could similarly say, well, let's ask reporters, you know, what sort of data do you want so that there would be kind of a better opportunity for the reporters to kind of carry out what's in the public interest, whether it be reporting about crime or reporting about uh, health issues or what have you. Um, so I think uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see a variety of different models for open government. I'm thrilled that the uh, open government partnership is is at play. I think there's some opportunity potentially as well as we kind of hinted for the open government partnership to step up and take a little bit more of a role in saying how valuable is open government uh, and how, uh, you know, how much does it contribute to public engagement or public trust? And here's a way that perhaps it would be nice to measure that across multiple countries so that we have, uh, you know, an ability to say, hey, you know, country A is doing really well and we hadn't even noticed that. Uh, and country B could learn some lessons and had thought it was doing a great job. But, you know, it turns out it's not doing such a great job. Um, so with that, uh, unless anybody who has any last remark, I think we will call this session complete and thank uh, each of the panelists very much for your participation and the energy you took to prepare the information and share. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye bye.